my parents were definitely, I'd say they were middle class, but things were tight. And I remember as a running trait, every single week, we'd have conversations in and around money. There were negative conversations. There was yelling. There was a bit of screaming. There was emotions. And I think as much as you can see as that as a negative, I think you can also see it as a positive as well. Um, it's definitely made me more resilient. Before we got on air, we were talking about how what most people struggle with, what most families struggle with, what most parents struggle with is this relationship with money. And you had something that you, you really wanted to share and they thought that was like a really interesting journey. So uh, my man, Steve, can you drop us some of your knowledge and your perspective on families, money, parents, the whole thing? Yeah, look, I mean, a big part of my life and what's driven me uh, to become, I guess, relentless in my pursuit to have an income, make sure that money isn't a negative chat, I guess, in my kids' um, childhood as well, is definitely from when I grew up. Um, my parents were definitely, I'd say they were middle class, but things were tight. And I remember as a running trait, every single week, we'd have conversations in and around money. There were negative conversations. There was yelling. There was a bit of screaming. There was emotions. And I think as much as you can see as that as a negative, I think you can also see it as a positive as well. Um, it's definitely made me more resilient and more driven towards money. And I see that as a big element of my success as well. What so, you- yeah, look, I mean, in regards to that, it's just the fact of the matter is it's tough and it's hard conversations. And I'm sure mom and dad wouldn't necessarily like me talking about it right now. But I think the positives that you can take out of those conversations from an early childhood will definitely set you off and be more resilient in the future. What are the most significant conversations that uh, that you experienced growing up? I think the yelling really, you, you could see the emotion, especially on my mum's face, which as a, you know, as a, as a, as a mama's boy, I think you never want to see your mum have raw, those raw emotions. You don't want to see your mum crying. You don't want to see her going through those tough times. So I definitely saw that. Um, I was savvy to all of those tough moments where they feel like, you know, you're going out for dinner and it's meant to be an ex- an experience, a really positive experience as well. And to see the pain when the bill comes out, mm. I think that was really evident. And I used to see that a lot um, when you go to the shopping center as well. And the pain when they're paying a bill or you have to put a few things back, I think that's really evident as well. So it's all those moments. It's not necessarily a moment, but it's all of those combined. How did you turn this around for your family? I think it created a chip on my shoulder. When I was young, I used to draw pictures of a house that I wanted to get for mum and dad, right? I was definitely, if there was a drawing that I was going to draw, it was of a house. And it's definitely something where I've told mum for years and years and years, and I've got a goal at the moment that I'll buy them a house. And I think it's that kind of idea. And it used to be, when I was early, um, when I was early on going through my, I guess, professional career as well, I used to ask people and it used to be a thing when I used to hire as well as I was like, what make, what wakes you up in the morning? Like literally what wakes you up in the morning? And for me, I used to tell them the thing that wakes me up in the morning is just so I don't have to have a negative conversation with my kids or my wife ever about money. Mm. And it's deep, it's raw, it's real. It's all of those things all in one where, Yeah, look, almost to the point where it's emotional and I get up every single day, whether it be the intent that I put in as a workout, um, the intent that I put into work and all of the above where it just makes me 
drive to be more, um, which is money related as well. I think we can all understand from our various levels of financial education that we all have different thermometers or thermostats about what level is appropriate, what kind of behavior that we want to see, and we can incorporate those lessons. Um, so that was really um, interesting to hear that you said that. Like, Not a lot of people would say, the thing that gets me up is that I never have to have this, this conversation. That That's really interesting. Are there any other conversations that you just never want to have with your fam with your family? Uh, look, I guess we're a family of dreamers. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if I think of my childhood and especially my dad as well, um, you know, we were, you know, dad's, you know, family came over in a boat to Australia, 1956. Um, Obviously, that's that you know the time of the war and and things like that. So he, he came over from Germany, uh, but Hungarian descent, and you know you understand the sort of struggles that they would have went through early on, uh, too. But it's just as that dreamer element in my dad, he always had a dream for more, that desire for more, and I just never want to have that conversation with my kids because I think I'm that dreamer too. And I believe that that's the most beautiful part of a child is, is that dreamer element, is that creative element, is that idea that I can absolutely do anything that I ever want to do. And I just never, when it's relation to money, I just don't want to I understand the resilience piece, but I just don't want my kids to have a struggle there. And it's like, no, you can't do that. And I, I think I hear that a lot in culture where it's like, no, you can't do that because it costs this. You won't be able to do that until you, you know, earn that amount of money. And it's just the dialogue, I think, that you can use. It's like, yes, there is an earning element and I'm not here to give my kids, you know, uh, you know, 50 a million dollars you know to go and do whatever they want whenever they want that's not what it's all about it's just more i guess the dialogue where it's you can't do this because of what i've created and i don't want to pass that on to my kids ever mm. how are you cultivating this dreamer personality this dreamer trait in your kids i think that creativity element and definitely when they come up to us, you know, because kids want to be, you know, if I think of my son, Will, um, you know, we went to his preschool graduation. Everyone wanted to be a firefighter, right? And I was like, cool, man, you can be a firefighter. But now he's a bit older and then he wanted to be a YouTuber. Obviously, everyone uh, of that age wants to be a YouTuber because they see, you know, Logan Paul and uh, Jake Paul and millions of dollars and buy Charizard cards. Right. But, um, but then, you know, and now he wants to be a professional soccer player and it's just about, you know, for me, it's like, I believe in hard work. I believe in making sure that those, I guess those skills are developed, but I just, I just, I'm just like, yes, yes, go for it, buddy. You know, it's, it's that positive recognition and positive enforcement uh with the kids where they can do what they want i just i'll never have a conversation where it's no i might bring in a bit of realism there and go well remember you have to do a bit of work to do that if i was you buddy you know i would be you know this is what you could do to make sure that you are that you know so i'll put those in place but i'll never say no What's something, uh, let's talk about something funny because all of our kids have these, these crazy notions, right. Of, of what they want to do and what they want to be. And you mentioned the YouTuber, like I want my kid, like my kid wants to be a YouTuber and, and my daughter has the same thing. Are there any, uh, so like one of the things that, that is interesting in, in this house is that, uh, so I'm on YouTube, I'm learning YouTube, I'm learning how to create content and creating the thumbnails, creating the scripts and it just being a better, being filmed better, being a better host, being, creating better content. And like one of the big challenges that I'm facing is just the, the basics, like 
how do I take person, uh, a person, a kid, you know, from zero, zero skill in, in the, in whatever skill it happens to be to at least not even competency, but just so that they understand the work involved. And so like, she wanted to tell stories. And so I said, oh, well, let's learn how to tell stories. And so I kind of breaking her through like the hero's journey and all the different steps and stuff like that. Are there any, any pieces where you've extended sort of a, for better or for worse, a, a dad lesson plan, plan, a dad, a dad plan on how to accomplish things or get things going? Yeah, look, I think honestly, uh, for my wife and I, our type of parenting is a little bit loose around the edges. So I'm definitely, we're definitely not those uh, parents that are going to go and sort of meticulously set things out. You know, we miss the odd bit, uh, bath time. You know, we miss the odd brushing of the teeth. Um, it's not really methodical in our household. I think where we do well, though, is more in the sense that I think we like I just co cultivate that creativity and that natural drive. I mean, for me, and even thinking about with our staff, you know, um, not that I want to sort of relate kids to the staff, but in some sense, it's a teaching element. And, you know, I think about when people need to get initially inspired, you want to go and grab them at their core and find out where that, where that creativity, where that drive, where that passion lies. So, for instance... You know, for me, I was, Will was talking about becoming a famous YouTuber. And so I was like, cool, well, who's you? Who's the most famous YouTuber? And he's like, well, this guy, this guy, and this guy. I'm like, cool, which one do you like the most? Well, I actually like this guy. I'm like, well, what does he do really well? He goes, well, he does this and this. But he reckoned that he jumps on trends and does this. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. How does he do that? And he's like, well, this, this, and this. I was like, okay. So he's literally dissecting the whole plan. He understands what they're actually doing. He's like, well, Mr. Beast, you know, he gives away cash and he does this. And then he throws in all these extra things into the video to make it really interesting. And it's like, well, there you go. There you go. So I'm not going to go and necessarily write down a plan of how to execute. But if it comes naturally to him and he comes to me and says, hey, I want to do this. I'll help him. And I think that's that's the type of parenting that we do. It's not necessarily like, all right, well, you want to be a famous YouTuber, let's go in, let's meticulously set out and go and derive these plans. But similar to what you've done where it's like, well, I want to tell stories. All right, well, how do you tell stories? And you've got a knowledge base of how to tell stories. And I think it's the culmination of what you can provide as a dad in regards to your experience alongside with, um, I guess your child's sort of natural creativity and uh, ideas of, of what they want to be as well. Awesome. That's, that's great. Uh, what else, like what you, you said some interesting things. So, you know, uh, for feel good fathers and definitely something that I promote is like a little bit of structure and routine. And you're like, Hey, that's not really, that's not really <laughs> our house. I'm like, oh, that's great. Well, <laughs> well, well, to be honest, it's uh it's probably something that I need to be a lot better at. Okay. So for feel good fathers, I would 120% go with what Jay's going with here. I think having a lack of structure and routine is probably something that, yeah, both of us need to be better at. And, you know, I know 150% when the kids are in bed by 738, I am a much better human to be around. So... Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's definitely something. Uh, I think there's a level, though, where you can take it too far and it becomes it becomes almost a job or a chore uh, versus, um, versus just being just a good dad and someone that's there for the kids. I think if, you, if you're so meticulous, um, I think it can obviously create benefits, but... Again, thinking about how I like to parent, I do like that creativity and that flow. Um, you know, I don't mind the kids talking back to me. I don't mind the kids, you know, having a bit tougher conversations. I don't mind the kids sort of 
getting in conversations with adults and they might say the wrong thing, I'm not going to go and pull them up for it because they need to learn for themselves. So I think that's the experiential learning 100%, you know, 100%. I think that they, they have to have some independence in, in, um, one of the common traits, right? Cause I definitely wouldn't say, go be a tiger mom, go be a tiger dad. Don't be a helicopter mm -hmm. parent. Don't do that. There's a certain level of you're losing yourself in that conversation. You're defining yourself by the routine of your kids. And, um, one of the great things, as you mentioned of, of kids is that they are super creative. They, they are very flexible. They don't want to go to bed. They don't want to brush your teeth. They don't want to do their homework, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's, that's completely fine. Um, it was, it was interesting to hear, to hear that. And then when you were describing further on that you're much more interested in the experiential learning, like, Hey, let's go figure this out. Like, that's wonderful. And that's another, another trait that feel good fathers should absolutely cultivate. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think it's probably, it's the way I learn as well. I find it really hard to learn. Um, I find it really hard to learn by watching YouTube videos. I just, my attention span just goes, I'm gone. I'm done within two to three minutes. Cool. What's, what's the next shiny object, which is, you know, some people say that's uh, ADD or ADHD, but each to their own. Um, so for me, I learn through experience. You know, all of my greatest lessons have been from failing. So I do believe that that's a great way to learn and it creates a thicker skin as well. So that's definitely something that I want to pass on to the kids. Mm -hmm. Any good examples of that one? That's a, that's a great common. We all for want me. That. Yeah. Yeah. For you. Oh, like for my, like my experience of yeah. like fail, fail. Yeah. Something you want to pass on, like something that you've done there. Uh, you know, a really tough one is that I really dislike and I shouldn't have learned it, but, um, and it, pains me every single day i was an absolute and utter pain in the ass with brushing my teeth mm. <laughs> and i was really gross you know it's like that really like gross thing i was like i reckon i would have spent 20 to thirty thousand dollars over the course of my adulthood to my age right now on my teeth oh. and it like it's so gross to think about that and it's just but i'm like well you know what it wasn't any uh dis purpose to ob obviously my parents it's just the fact that i was just a painful human but i could tell you a million ones through business and, and different things like that but i don't know in something that relation to obviously from when i was a kid that's definitely one um but generally speaking you know it's like i'm a jump in the ocean kind of guy you know it was definitely I'd never played a sport before, you know, I've never played T-ball before. I'd go and just try out for the next, you know, the next version of, for us, it was like a, a regional um, or a state level um, competition. And I just like, I'd be like, all right, cool. I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Um, so I think things like that. And if you can push your kids into moments or experiences like that, not worry about their emotions of how they're going to feel if they don't, win or they don't you know succeed i think those experiences where it's like hey mate or hey audrey go and jump into the deep end and just see what happens it's all good you know go and jump on that stage go and jump you know um go and try that sport it's okay if you haven't practiced it before or anything like that just go and try it it's crazy you know my son's very risk adverse in the sense of he doesn't want to have a new experience. Hmm. But I think all of us as, you know, as parents as well, it's funny when you go and throw your kid into a certain situation and then all of a sudden they're, they love it. They absolutely love it. You know, and it's like, oh, if you just, if you just kind of hold on to that kind of, uh, hold off on the, all those emotions and all that sort of negativity and anxiety and just jumped in and just, fully embraced it. Um, whereas my daughter on the other side is the complete opposite. She's like, you know, she goes to school in two days and she's like, throw me on the bus. Why would I want to get dropped to school? My brother's on the bus. It's a double decker. How cool. 
get me on there. Whereas, you know, I think, you know, with my son, we were like, oh, okay, we'll drive him to school for the first term and things like that. And we sort of uh, cuddle them a little bit too much as well. I love it. That's, um, you mentioned the experiential learning. You know, it's the one, uh, having that foundation of different experiences, different uh, capabilities of trying something new or even sticking with something for the long term, they both, they, they show different traits, right? Sticking to something for the long term teaches through experience, the dedication, the commitment, the showing up every day, the consistency and the, and the success that comes from that, right? And that's very, that's very business. And then the other side is the new experiences, new relationships, uh, new things to try, new limits to discover. And that's very business. And that's very, you know, and that's very- Yeah, uh, for sure. I, like I do, I do definitely take a lot of, because I'm in business and I love business and it's all, I can see the benefits of business. I find business easier than being a parent, definitely. Mm. Um, but yeah, so like, do you have any, like in that experiential learning, do you have any sort of moments with your kids where it's like, oh, it's so good that, you know, I pushed it, you know, a deep end, I pushed them into the deep end and they sort of had a great experience. Oh, a lot. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the first one, so it was interesting. What was the one that was very recent? Um, so we, we do Taekwondo in the house and at first I didn't because it was just, I was working out at the time. So I was like, all right, well, I want to go weight training instead. And then, so she was in it for a while and she's like, daddy, you got to come do it. And then teacher like master Phillips came over. Who's, who's my, uh, he's my master for the Taekwondo school. He's like, do you want to come? Cause I have martial arts in my background. And so we've been doing this for about a year and a half, two years now, which has been fantastic. But what's happening at this moment is that there's the, oh, I don't want to go. And so there's that pushing forward of the stay committed, get over that, get over that blase, that blase feeling. And I, I tell the story of there's a, a famous Olympian coach and he says, um, there's going to be three ways that you feel when you're training for the Olympics. Cause we all have these weird ideas in our heads that when we're doing something and if you're passionate about the thing, and if you have purpose behind it, that it's always going to be roses and prairies and butterflies and fucking rainbows. Like it's not that right. And he says that, that here's the thing, there's going to be one third of the time. You're going to absolutely love everything you're doing. It's going to be really easy to do. You're going to show up, you're going to execute well, and it's going to be really enjoyable. One third of the time, it's going to be a lot of work and you're, you're probably not really going to enjoy it that much, but you're stretching, you're growing. And then the other third of the time you're, you're in the mud and it sucks and it's cold and it's wet and you want to go home and you don't want to be there. And if it's about that distribution, that's about what you should expect from life. A third mm. of the time, it's going to be great. A third of the time, it's going to be okay. And a third of the time, you're not going to want to be there. I think that's great. And I think that that lesson of like, Hey, you've been putting the time in for a year and a half. Let's go. Another one that came up uh, for her specifically was, um, roller skating. She just didn't really want to do it. And then, and then we were like, well, she was doing ice skating, right? So she was doing ice skating. It didn't, it didn't jive. I have hockey in my background for very long. Um, yep. and she just didn't, she was like, oh, I want to skate like dad. And so we were like, sure, take some lessons. Right. And it didn't really jive with her. And then we were like, well, do you want to try roller skating? No, I don't want to do it. It's going to be like ice skating. She loves it. So that initial yeah. hump of like, just look, you don't really know until you get on the field, you can't stay in the stands for forever. You got to get on the court. You got to get in the field. You got to go play. Yeah. I think that's, um, it's confidence, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, how do I become a great YouTuber? It's like, I put in the reps. I drive through the mud, it gets a little bit better Then all of a sudden that person or those people, or I start to get recognized or all of that muddy stuff that I've pushed through. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's crazy how much or how little we talk about confidence in just day-to-day -day life, especially with kids, everything, right? I don't believe in fake confidence, but I believe in, 
the hard work confidence, like I've put in the reps, you know, real confidence is you have experiences and you've been through things. So, uh, David Goggins recently on modern wisdom was talking about this. He says, you know, I went through uh, seal team buds training seal week three times. I did a hundred mile marathon. I did 200 mile this, I did that. And he has all these experiences. And when you, when you have this backlog of memory, of stuff that you've mm-hmm. done, that's real confidence. Cause then you have a comparison, you know what you're capable of. You know, I've got, yeah. I've got stuff like that in my past. Um, a lot of, you know, you're in business. A lot of business owners have that. Like the first year for business sucks. It sucks. Mm. It's like, what is it? It's something like 90% of business of all businesses close in the first year. By the time yeah. you get to year five, 3% are there. 3% have made it. That's wild. Most businesses don't ever earn more than six figures. Most mm. businesses never earn more than half a million dollars in their lifetime. Wow. Like it's just hard. Like if you hit any yeah. of those milestones, it's huge. <laughs> like you are, yeah. You're yeah. Well. yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So it's interesting that you say obviously, you know, you're talking about business there and, and how each those sort of like it's a big thing if you hit those milestones as well. I think that's something that I'm actually really quite terrible at um, is acknowledging those milestones. It's definitely, and I think when you think about dads in general, especially with their boys, because I do this with my boy too, in the sense that I'm all, for me, I'm always searching for what's next. And it's so bad when you think of building confidence to keep doing that because enough is never enough. And I, not that you shouldn't keep going. I mean, like Goggins is like, go, 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 push, you know. And I love that mentality. But I think from a younger age when, when you're learning, I think that's why sometimes, you know, boys go to their moms is because they get that more. They're like, I'm so proud of you. Congratulations on doing this. There's, there's a little bit more love there, but for, mm. and I just, na- we, I think we naturally do it. I naturally do it where it's like, cool. All right. So, you know, you've got the top corner of the net three times when you kick that ball in, can you do it 10 now? You know, and it's like, it's like, Oh, you know, instead of just going, in the moment and just being stoked and not having to push more, I do find myself kind of pushing more. One of the things that I try and balance with feel good fathers is I'm either talking to them or, or just learning is there's, um, there's this great book by Dr. Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan called the gap in the game. And so this is specifically okay. for entrepreneurs that talk about that right there, that whole mindset of constantly hitting the horizon, constantly looking at the mountain, constantly more, constantly creating, constantly going after solving the next problem. And it creates a real misery. There's a real true mm. misery in that because nothing's ever enough. And what, and what they, what he says. And so Dan Sullivan is strategic coach. He's really into entrepreneurial coaching and he's the mindset, like the mind of the entrepreneur. When you measure the gain, when you measure where you've come from, you can still have the goals run towards the horizon, run as fast as you can at that mountain, climb the next mountain, do the thing. But when you've got the goals and you measure against the goals, how far you've come, you can have satisfaction, fulfillment, and success and all the good feelings with everything that you've done and the hunger to hit that next stage. So you can kind of have both. Uh, so there's that, that core idea. I definitely think that would be something to take a look at. But the other one that's really worked because I had that, that same, that same drive, even with my daughter, I had that same thing. I'm like, yeah, okay, but can you do this? But I think part of, I think part of the masculine energy of the father is to test the limits to show it's, it's why we wrestle. It's why we, there's physical play. It's why I think there's all these, you know, it's why we take them outside. There's like, if you look mm. at the patterns of what fathers do for their kids, expose them to new music, give them new experiences, take them outside, teach them specific skills, push their limits, show them what they're made of, drive them forward, give them that, that like that rah, rah, go momentum energy. 
right? Those are those are good things. Those are things that we, um, those are things that maybe they need to be balanced against other things like the nurture side, like the the cuddling and the your comforts and the emotional balance and the social skills. But that's that's why there's masculine and feminine. That's why we have both. And so, how I balance that and why I told about the gap in the gain was sometimes. Yes, there's a, hey, can you hit 10? Because then you're saying like, hey, man, like hitting 10, that's better than hitting three. So you're creating that drive. But then on the other side, there's also that acknowledgement. And I, I say it to my daughter all the time now is you got a really good grade on your last whatever, your test or your report. You studied. You studied your ass off. You studied really hard. Like you worked every single day for the past two weeks for that test and you got 100. What does that tell you? If I want a good grade, I, I study every day. Yeah, that's good. You earned that. And so like, I don't know. I think there's, there's something in both. I think there's something in acknowledging the work and the effort. It shows her that if she puts the time and the effort in, she can create whatever she wants, which is that run towards the horizon energy, but it also reflects back on how she created it. And so it's like, oh, because here's the truth. Running towards the horizon isn't reproducible, but all that stuff in the game all the lessons, all that experience, all that wisdom, everything we were talking about earlier on in the conversation, that's that's yeah. that's reproducible. Yeah, that that's yeah, stuff. it is the magic. That is the magic. And it's um it's interesting, especially like going back as that dreamer element within me as well. I think that's part of it where you just sort of forget what gets you to places as well. Uh, and you don't, you know, hyper analyze, but yeah, you know, it being in business as well is like, it's definitely, I need to, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's just good. It's good. You just gotta, you gotta break it down. You gotta break it down in essence. And as you just said, with the test, it's like, cool, we studied, you know, and then you can break that down. It's like, well, remember when you did, you know, 30 minutes here, 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 you know, and then. Remember, like after dinner, you know, the first thing you did was this instead of doing this. That's what got you the result of 100. And how do you feel on the result of the 100? Well, I feel great. Why do you feel great? Well, it's great to get acknowledgement. It's great to, you know, get a perfect score. It's great to this. Cool. Do you want to recreate that feeling? Yes, I do. So linking it back, what do you need to do? I need to do more of that after dinner, X, Y, Z. So that's good. I love the idea of just saying, what do you want in life? Great. How did you create that so far? Cool. As, do more of that. Yeah. It's so wildly <laughs> like, simple. As, as simple as that. And is. I think that's the most beautiful way to look at life is in its simplest form. We really, I think with, you know, and to be honest, we're creating more content right now, but it is a highly saturated world and of content. And this is why there is podcasts like this, because it's hard to work through all the noise and all the BS um, that's out there. And it's hard to know which one to listen to and which one to action and how to do this and what I should be doing now. And it's just like, what's the simplest thing I can do right now? You know, and it's just like, all right, well, if I want to, cut down a tree, I need to walk out to the tree with a saw and start, you know, putting in those motions to cut down the tree. It's whereas like we almost kind of like hyper analyze everything and it's like, well, is the weather good? What if it falls the wrong way? What if it does this? What if it does that? What if it does this? What if it does that? Well, I've heard here you know, you can do this. I could get crushed. I could go to the hospital. Oh my God, I'm going to die. And all of a sudden we don't try anything. One of the, I think there's so many great lessons in humanities. And one of the, one of the cultural differences between say the U S and Japan, because I have geek culture in my life. And so I think about anime and stories and movies, right? You watch a, a Japanese or an Asian based movie. And it's about, it's always about who they are like uh demon slayers on netflix it's just really beautiful they've combined this 
ancient uh, 19th century painting style, the flat 2D Japanese painting style with 3D motion. It's just, it's a gorgeous anime if you're into that. A little bit gorgeous, <laughs> whatever. Um, don't watch it with your kids. Uh, and one of the ways that the, the main character has to, it's some minor stories, but he's got to cut through a boulder with his sword. If you know anything about rocks and metal, is that the rock usually wins. Like, it just, it just does. But he learns through that that he's got to get better. It has nothing to do with the sword that he's got, nothing to do with anything else. It's just like, if he trains, he gets better. It's the same thing with uh, uh, Dragon Ball Z, the, the, the Saiyans, the Super Saiyans and Dragon Ball Z, right? They, uh, the human, uh, why Goku is so cool is that most creatures in, in the universe, they get better by training. And then there's a cap. So it's like humans can get to X, like this race can get to Y, this, what, this other one can get to Z. And so there's like this limit and they express everything in numbers. So it's like power level, whatever. Uh, but the Saiyans, if they live through an encounter, they just get these huge bumps. So if they get beat up and they live and they heal, they get, they go like, they get this huge power level increase. So they have like really what, what it's yeah. like to be in the real world. Cause that Dragon Ball Z world where you have to do things and you have to train and you do, if you do things and you train, you're going to succeed and fail. And you're just going to kind of level up as you go along the way. This is very contrasted with what you were talking about, how people lack that motivation. It's rainy. I don't feel good. Blah, blah, blah. That's a very American way that they're looking at things. And the American way is what do I have? If I have a bigger gun, I can take on a bigger baddie. Well, maybe not. Like maybe all you need is sure. a, like a, a knife or something like that, like in using video game parlance and stuff like that. So it's about that, that constant um, analysis of, do you have yeah. a thing or am I the person? And if you can, if you can reconcile the two uh, just from looking at silly yeah. cartoons and anime and humanities, which I, which I love and enjoy. It's like, if you can reconcile them, you can like, you can combine them to, to really great effect. Do you imagine really great person? Do you imagine how cool it would be if we could go Super Saiyan though? That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, was so, I was just like, I think about it. I was like, oh, it'd be so good if we could. There's almost there's like a weird hack there to some degree. It'd be interesting if someone you know, or if there is something out there, that possibly is, but um, like a set of tasks. You know, imagine if like you had like. 5,000 tasks or 5,000 things that you had to do. And then you were no, and then you were recognized as the super Saiyan version of Steve, right? Like, it's like, Oh, you've done those 500 tasks. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And I've dyed my hair blonde too, because I am super (laughs) Saiyan. (laughs) And you could power. And it unnaturally stands up high, but it's, uh, it's a, it's a cool way to look at it in a, in a sense where it's like, okay, well, if I want to be the super version of myself, I need to write out, you know, 500 tasks that I just absolutely don't want to do, but I need to do. Do you imagine how how powerful you would become? And then, you know, to pass on that sort of wisdom as well. Um, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I, I think through this conversation, there was the immediately like, yeah, I could beat this crazy warrior and, and, and develop this power, but... I'm thinking about, okay, well, going to college is kind of like that. Having a business is kind of like that. Building your body, you know, like I I can tell like you work out, you know, I work out martial arts. I was thinking about like being a black belt, like being a black belt in any of these martial arts, that's, that's not insignificant. Mm. Winning competitions is the same thing, you know, like for the Olympians, it's like they, like I was saying, like they have days of suck. They got to put in the time, you know, like most Olympians, they train for like a decade before they're 18. Yeah. So like from their from the they're my daughter's age, yeah, and they're starting, yeah, and they're uh, and they're doing brutal eight to ten to twelve hours, you know. If you think about our our Olympians, it's like they're amazing. They're dancing. They're they're gymnasts. They're they're shot puts. The strength, the lifting, the the crazy things that they go through, and and they and you know, and they're they're born as this baby that can't talk, can't walk, can't eat. You know, <laughs> like can't do anything. Everything's gonna be taught. All the same too, eh? All the yeah. same. We are. So yeah. yeah.
So I, I think I think in that in that regard, you know, I, I think we are super saiyans. Okay, cool. <laughs> so. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, you brought up something I thought was really great, and it's it's directly related to this whole super saiyan topic. And you learned something cool from your your dad, and you're telling me about this, and it was about this reward structure that you earned for doing good things. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a, it was definitely an interesting way to do it and not necessarily, I guess the way that everyone would naturally kind of go about a reward structure. But in essence, dad is into self-development. My whole, you know, I kind of claim it as mine, but realistically he's the self-development king. He had all the tapes, all the videos, everything. Um, and even to the point, you know, being in Australia, he flew over and did the, the one or two week intensive with Tony Robbins and he's walked on fire and climbed the totem pole. And, you know, we've watched that video a bunch of times where he's climbed the totem pole and jumped off and reached out for the, uh, reached out for the, or is it little trapeze thing as well? So the thing is, is. He obviously sees the benefit of self-development and reading and things like that. So he had a bunch of books and from a young age, so I've got two older sisters as well. Uh, he set up a program or in that program was, um, I believe it was like, if you start a book, you get X amount of dollars, but then if you finish the book, you get X amount of dollars. And then I think if you finish it in a certain time frame, you got a little bit of a bonus as well. And then if you were able to recreate and reiterate what was in the book and the, you know, the learnings of that book into like a little sort of one page essay, then you got a little bonus as well. So I'm an absolute millionaire now. No, <laughs> read so many books. Uh, actually, I was really bad at it, but I think the concept and idea around that not that i really i didn't really connect with the words and the types of books that he was giving us but i think subliminally i was definitely bringing it in and understanding certain parts it might have only been three sentences out of a whole book but that reward structure got me into reading a little bit that's awesome yeah that, yeah that's great like I mean, books for, you know, books for kids, especially in today's climate, right? They've got YouTube, they've got TV, they have video games, uh, they got their buddies, they got, they got, they got computers on their watches. They got AI, they've got AI now. Yeah, they have AI, right. You have all this stuff (laughs) that's interesting and crazy and cool and the future and Star Trek and, and life is great. And, uh, I mean, just that, just that concept of. I will pay you to read, (laughs) you know, sit down with the boring book, activate everything in your imagination, get what you can, like the, the, the follow-up piece there. It's not just reading the book, but it's the, uh, we had one, we had one very similar to this. We said you had to read the Harry Potter books. Thank you, JK. Read the Harry Potter books before you could watch the movies. Mm. And so over a year, she, basically read all the Harry Potter books. Cool. She even, she even tried to teach treat, uh, to cheat once. She, she, she said she had read one and then we were like, well, what happened in this book? And then she couldn't say, and we were like, you haven't read it. She was like, nope. And so, you know, we had a little bit of that, but cool. what a great, what a great structure to, to pass on. Yeah. Do you do that with your kids? Uh, no, <laughs> no. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, not at this stage, to be honest. Uh, it was, this structure was set up when we were a little bit older and I was reading like rich dad, poor dad. And, right. you know, and I guess a little bit more, which really, when you think about it, um, like I've got this weird obsession with real estate, like weird sort of ultimate desire. And, you know, that sort of like investing and making sure that I've got, you know, cash flow positive and all this sort of thing. Right. And it's like, did that come from that book when I was 13, 14? Did that desire or that kind of willingness, did it help it? Did it inspire it? Did it kind of, did it help manifest it? Did I take it to the next level with it? Um, and I think 
you know, like dropping those ideas and what you've done with the Harry Potter books is epic, to be honest. It's like, you know, when you're telling me this story, I just, you know, crawled inside myself as a little bit of a human because that is a good dad thing to do. <laughs> and that is a good teaching moment. So pat on the back there, good sir. Um, Thank you. Definitely try and bring it in in elements. Um, but I will say that for a lot of our parenting, we've been coping not so much um, dominating, so to speak. So we were probably a bit younger uh, when we had kids, not super young. And, but we definitely didn't know ourselves and we didn't know how to be parents necessarily. So it's definitely been a learning experience that we just sort of slowly get better at. Try not to bash it, bash ourselves up too much um, because, you know, it's all part of the journey and they'll take different things out of different experiences. Um, but fundamentally, um, I look at how I would parent differently at my age now versus um, where I was at sort of eight, nine years ago would be completely different. So as much as I'm an advocate for being a younger parent because you can run around and do the cooler stuff and I like to think that I'm cooler than most of the parents that, that uh, my kids have got because I'm a little bit younger and they're old and slow and that just makes me feel a little bit better. But <laughs> but fundamentally from a, from a teachings element, um, I can see the benefits of – putting a few few years of wisdom on yourself before you have kids. I think if we were to define wisdom, wisdom is knowing that you know nothing. And I think that it, just the fact that you have this thought and that you've reflected on it means that you're doing, you're doing fine. Thanks, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> appreciate right. that. So Steve, you have a company, Kings of Neon. If folks want to get a hold of you, they want to reach out to you, they want to uh, follow up with you in some way, where can they go? Uh, so for everyone in the US, it's kingsofneon.com. Um, and then AU, it's kingsofneon.com.au. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. You have to listen to Jay's podcast if you want to develop and be a great father. So hit subscribe. Well, thank you. And for Feel Good Fathers, uh, right now, right, right about there is another video. It's going to be one of mine. YouTube's going to tell you this is the next one you should watch. So go ahead and watch that one. You won't, you won't want to miss it.